Great. Well, this is a fantastic opportunity to talk about shoes, Ina. So I'll introduce myself and then you can uh, introduce yourself and then we'll go into the video. So I'm Alison and I'm Chief Exec of Accelerate, uh, but I'm also um, a nurse specialist in leg ulcers. So this is a particular interest of mine. So Ina, tell us about yourself. Okay, so I'm a Kiwi, which meant that I'd travelled just a little bit before I got to the UK. And when I worked in Asia, I actually was the footwear consultant for what was at that time the largest sportswear store throughout Asia. And um, I think most women have a passion for shoes. But after 17 years in surgical footwear, I sort of am really embedded in the idea that shoes are not fashion items. Yes, okay, they are. But there's so much more and I don't think we utilize them and people don't understand what they can do for them. So I hope that today we're going to be able to answer some questions and give some people some ideas, but we've got a video for you to watch. So I hope that will get us on a good start. And think through this about your questions. Yes. So while they are, Ina, you're um, our podiatrist in our team, senior podiatrist. And yes. so I think you and I have worked together for, ooh, how long? Is it something 22 like years. 22 years, goodness gracious. Here's the music. Here's, Here's the music. So this is sounding promising. Hello, my name's Ina Farrelly and I work here at Accelerate leading on mobility because mobility is so important to keeping us healthy both physically and mentally. And we use lots of tools to keep our patients mobile but one of the ones that everybody uses is shoes. So I'm gonna to talk to you right now about how to pick a safe shoe. Now, there are lots of things that I could tell you, to be honest, but I'm going to keep it to three things. And these are the things that I think are the three most important things to ensure that you are going to have a shoe that works with you, not against you. Now, on the table here, we've got a court shoe been around for hundreds of years, it will outlive both you and I. And it's a very popular style. Every woman still wears this to work today. The thing about the court shoe though, and they are generally extremely well made, they usually have a nice heel cup and so forth, is, look at that lovely wobble. You've raised it up, you've actually got a really small platform that you're resting the back of your foot on. But the thing that always drives me totally nutty is actually the only part of your foot that's in the shoe properly is your toes. And in order to keep a court shoe or a slip-on shoe of any description on, you either buy the shoe way too small so the foot's rammed into that shoe, or you pretend to be a parrot and you're clawing and hanging on with your toes. So we're going to get rid of this one. Fine for weddings and job interviews, but otherwise it's going to the side. So what do I think is important? Again, we're going to go with three key features that you need to look for in any shoe. So let us look at a shoe that you're all familiar with and you go, oh, we knew she was going to pull the trainer out. The trainer has all three of these things. It has a fastening. We've been making shoes for over 3000 years and we still have not improved on laces as a fastening, but we do have things like straps and buckles, Velcro, even zips. Something that ties the shoe on your foot, not your foot trying to hang on to it like a parrot. The other thing, of course, that it has is a nice firm heel counter, okay? Now, in some shoes, you can actually see the stitching around this part, and it goes and it cups the heel because we know that your foot goes up and down, but your foot also goes from side to side. So any shoe needs to provide support on the sides as well. So that heel cup should be as hard as you can get it. Trainers will also um, give you support here or any lace-up shoe. But the interesting thing about trainers is people think this is a fashion statement, all these bits of straps here. What the company is actually doing is adding in strength across the midfoot. So you've got this bracing. And if you look at something like a running shoe, it will have less bracing across here than say something like a basketball boot, which is a multi-directional sport where your foot is moving around a lot. 
And then of course there is the soul. What's really important about the soul is the soul bends in the same place that your foot bends. This is bending where my foot bends, at the ball of my foot. If the shoe bends back here, your foot doesn't bend back here, your shoe shouldn't be doing it either. So a trainer pretty much encapsulates all three points and things like uh, brogue shoes, nice lace up brogue shoes will do exactly the same. But I'm going to talk now about some styles that we see elsewhere that we're very used to seeing around and why some of the features of those shoes might personally disturb me and while I recognise we all wear them, there are things you need to be aware that are weaknesses in those styles. So I'm going to have a backless shoe. So many of my patients say, oh, I wear mules or um, flip-flops, as you call them here in England. So again, you, your foot is hanging loose. There is no heel cup at all on either of these styles. I'm very fond of these. I think they're quite a cute little shoe, but the foot has no support. Remember the foot goes up and down. It also goes from side to side. There is no support there. Great if you've got a perfect foot. And then we have the ubiquitous flip-flop, or as we call it, a New Zealander jandal. What I want you to look at here is what's happened to the heel. Because there is basically no upper on a flip-flop, your foot moves all over the place. And you can see by comparing the thickness on the outside back of this flip-flop with the inside back, that the foot actually sits here. It doesn't sit here, it sits here. And so you've now created, or I've created, a wedge that forces my foot into a rolled in position when I'm using these flip flops. So you can tell, not a big fan of either of those styles. So you go, even in England we have nice summers and you want to wear sandals. And I wear sandals. What you're looking for is a sandal with a back on it. So even though it doesn't have a heel counter, it's not going to have the same support, your foot is tied into that shoe. That, that sandal is not really going to go very far. And you've got a nice rocker, which if you've seen the video I talk about rockers, look, you've got a rocker on that sandal as well. Nice cushioning. When we do this, it bends where my foot bends. So you can get sandals that may not be as good as a trainer, but they're certainly um, better than, say, a flip-flop. So I'm going to put him to the side, and we're going to look at this. Now this is revisiting the whole backless thing again, where I've said, mm, backless shoes are not great for your feet, no support on the side. But the reason why I've got this particular one on the table is actually its sole. If you've got a backless shoe and you're not tied in the shoe, having a house shoe or any type of shoe that won't bend at all is not a great idea, okay? These are actually a risk to you falling. Don't be afraid in a shoe shop to pick shoes up and twist them around and see how strong they are and how flexible they are and flexible in the right part. Okay, so these are really go in the bin. I only keep them to show this to people. So you're gonna to say to me, Ina, I have to go to work. I have to be dressed smartly. So I can't wear trainers to work. I hear this line all the time. So what have we got here? Basically, these are versions of a woman's court shoe, but they all have fastenings on them in different places. So you can see that they're low cut, they've got a heel, not a particularly high heel, but the shoe itself is a lot more stable, particularly my purple friend here. Um, this guy is really quite stable, nice low heel, and he's got a rocker. It's amazing where these rockers pop up. And look at that, a nice hard heel counter. And you're tied in the shoe. So what you have to do with footwear is not despair. You just need to think a bit laterally. You need to think, what are the three things? I must be tied in my shoe. I must have a really nice solid heel counter. And my sole of my shoe should bend with my foot not against it. It shouldn't be collapsing back here, okay? So there you go, don't despair. There are pretty shoes out there that you can utilize. I'm gonna 
talk a little bit now about something that isn't necessarily something everybody has to worry about, but it's the swollen foot. The ever favorite Doc Martin and just an ordinary lace-up shoe. So this is a really good shoe. It's got a nice heel counter, and on this one you can actually see the stitching. It's laced up, and it bends in the right place. So what's wrong with this? Absolutely nothing. But if you've got a swollen foot and you come down to here, which is the bottom of the quarters in the shoe trade, these are stitched down. So if you have swelling along this part of the foot, you're gonna really struggle to get your foot into this lovely little shoe. So look for a shoe that's got a removable insole, okay? And because I've chosen this style, of course I'm gonna to have to dig. So this does have a removable insole because I've taken it out. Okay, so these have got removable insoles in them. Of interest, we've got our fashion shoe here has a removable insole. You will be surprised what shoes on the market you can take the insole out. And what that means is if you have a swollen foot, it's going to give you more depth in the shoe. There are certain companies like Comfs, which is actually a New Zealand brand, that tend to make their shoe a bit deeper anyway. But a removable insole, really good trick. Brands like Hotters and Echoes, um, Geox, they do them as well. But getting back to our friend, the Doc Martin, whom we all love, removable insole. But the difference between these two guys is down the bottom. Remember I said this really well-made shoe, good shoe, and it's sewn down here, right? If we go over to our man Doc, we can see that the shoe laces further down the foot. So you have a lot more of the shoe that actually, and it's a bit difficult because it can be confusing because this is a boot and this is a shoe. But if you look, you can see how much further down here the Doc Martin laces. And what that means is you've got that much more upper that will open to allow for swelling. The other thing is the fact, remember, I keep saying these are sewn down here. The Doc will open right out. So it's what we call open quarters when you're making shoes. And it just means that if your foot is swelling up, you've got a lot more adaptability in that shoe to accommodate your swelling. And you'll notice again, the dock has the ever popular rocker going on there. So three things to remember. Must have a fastening. Must have a nice firm heel counter and must bend where your foot bends. So that's for everybody, guys, everybody. If you've got swollen feet, look for them lacing down your foot lower. Look and see if they've got a removable insole and check and see if the quarters will open out a bit to give you more adaptability for that swollen foot. So you can probably tell shoes are a bit of a passion of mine. <laughs> they can be something that makes you feel wonderful and special and float on air, or they can be something that literally cripples you. Make the right choice. I hope what I've told you today helps you do that. Thank you for listening. Well, are we back? <laughs> Thank you very much, Ina. Uh, some of the syncing wasn't as great, but uh, maybe it was just me. I don't know. Yeah, but I, I was like, oh, I'm... <laughs> and actually, I have been trying to type some answers to some questions. And I'm not quite sure if everybody can see them or not. So, so this, what we'll do I know, is I'll, I'll ask the questions because you, so you can concentrate on the yep. answers. But we've got quite a few questions, so um, we'll have to be uh, brief. I think Smart. we've got about um, 15 to 20 minutes. So that's really good. One of the first questions we've got is, is it OK to wear some impractical shoes sometimes? or um, but not all the time or will it damage your feet in the longer term good question very good question and one that I get asked a lot by patients actually because they come in and go you're going to put me in cripple shoes the reality is if you're going out to dinner if you're going to a wedding I mean a pair of trainers just aren't going to work with that floaty dress and people are going to ignore me anyway you are fine. If you are going to dinner, you're going to be sitting down most of the time anyway. The problem becomes when you wear these things day in and day out. You maybe only wear trainers 
during the weekend. You've only got to look at a woman standing on the tube and their face to know they're in agony. So I would say, <laughs> take your shoes off, wear your trainers on the tube if you're commuting or whatever. If you're going shopping in Oxford Street, you know you're going to be on your feet for hours, then wear, you know, sensible shoes. And sensible shoes can be winter boots, you know, I think people get this mindset that shoes that are sensible, in my language, are going to be ugly. That's not always the case. Think laterally, think comfortable. If your feet are uncomfortable, that's your body saying, these shoes are not good for you. But yeah, if you're getting dressed up, if you want to look special, wear what you want. I thought your description of um, clinging on like a parrot was a good one. And, and I suppose from a personal experience, I, I think some shoes for me feel less tiring to wear. Yes, and I yes. wonder if that's because, uh, 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 you know, the sort of less sensible shoes I am clinging on. So is, is, a, is, is tiring um, a good description? It is actually a really good description because I always say to patients, if you are tying a shoe on your foot with whatever means, whether it's zip, laces, strap and buckle, you are reducing just like that, the amount of work that your feet are having to do. So your feet are actually just going to be focusing on walking, not trying to hang on to things that are hanging off the end of their foot. And the other thing to remember is that if you are, if you've taken away all that work, they're just tied on your shoes, on your feet securely. What that means is that you can then walk Properly. So if you've got problems with edema or, you know, circulation, then it gives your foot pump and your calf pump a much better chance of actually functioning more normally. And if you're not, if you're doing the shuffle or the clonk, 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 because look at women with the other thing women do with slip on shoes is they push their knees back and they push their bum back. So it's not just your feet that get tired. It's actually the rest of your body as well. So I'm always, I don't know if awe is the right word, but I'm totally amazed that women can wear slip-on shoes day in, day out. So someone's just asked, um, does it have to be a laced up shoe? What, you know, you describe laces as being very effective. They what are. About zips or Velcro? So you'll see most winter boots uh, have a zip up the side these days. Even the lace up ones have a zip up the side because it's easy and that's fine. Um, what I would say with boots, though, if you've got a, a zip, is make sure there's an elastic gusset at the top to give you a bit of leeway. Um, Velcro is, you know, surgical footwear's lifesaver because, of course, it's difficult for some people if they've lost that dexterity in their hands to do up laces. So Velcro is great. Strap and buckle, brilliant. You know, so there are other options. It's just we kind of know laces are the best. So, um, so what what your really telling us is that the shoe needs to be fixed to the foot in some way yeah. to make it less tiring to make it more comfortable but also you're moving your ankle uh more productively yeah. okay yeah. and someone's just asked about um measuring actually um it says i always advise people um to get their feet measured yearly we use lose weight gain weight feet can become edematous and changes with arthritis is once a year a good idea? Well, strangely enough, most people won't have one of these, which is a size stick. And um, so it is interesting. It's a whole sort of political football because in Britain, all shoes sizes should follow the British standard. However, I can tell you, I have shoes in my cupboard that range in size from a three to a seven because I buy stuff that fits my feet. And the problem is you, there are, if you go around the UK, you'll see a sticker in some shoe shops, usually smaller shoe shops, and it says the Shoe Fitting um, Association. And it means they've actually done a little qualification on how to fit shoes. Oh. When we make shoes, there's some, we do on average minimum of eight measurements on a, on a foot to make a bog standard shoe. If someone's got an interesting foot, it's even more. So the problem with going and getting measured, and I do have patients that come in and say to me, oh, will you measure my feet? And I can do that. That's not a problem. The problem is that if I say to them, right, so you're going to take a five and they go off and actually they buy something that was made in Indonesia or Korea or in Europe, actually all those sizes are going to be slightly different. Yeah. So actually, because this is a Blue Peter moment, here's one I prepared earlier in that we were talking 
earlier about people locked down, people are buying stuff out of catalogs and mm. online and all the rest of it. And when, so what I generally say to people is if you're buying out of a catalog, do this and send it with your order. And wow. literally you sit down, you hold a skinny pen up and you go around the outside of your foot. And then you'll see that I've measured across the ball of my foot. And that means the company, so we recommend, we usually have some catalogs in the waiting room and they're things like um, DB and Cozy Feet and a few others. If you send this with the order, the company will go, oh, okay, that's our size four or that's our size five. Because the other thing, and I had a very disturbing experience when I got my feet measured here, was I'm sitting there and the girl goes to me, you're a size three. And I went, no, I'm not. That's a British size stick. A British size stick measures the size of your foot. And then you add on two, two sizes to get your shoe size. But she'd been trained using the American device that measures the shoes. So it is a really tricky one. If you can find a local shop that has done their footwear measuring certificate, great, go and get your feet measured. If not, just be very aware that, and actually I can't remember if I've done a, a video on sort of like fitting your shoes. My mother always used to say, and it is standard in the industry, that when you are sitting down with some weight going through your feet, or even when you're standing up, you should have your thumb width between the end of your toe and the end of the shoe. And the other thing is, if you have done up your kids' laces or your own laces, and you yank on the back of the foot and the shoe starts moving up and down, then that fit isn't good for you either. So mm -hmm. it is a bit of a tricky one, but yeah, look out for that sticker in the window for the Shoe Fitters Association. I mean, I think it's interesting, you know, it, for those of us that have had kids, we'll do this. We'll, you know, you've got to measure your kids' feet and do the right thing. But once we're adults, we think that we're past all of that. You know, well, it, it really is. Uh, I'm into comfort, I have to say, um, uh, rather than something that's going to squeeze the life out of my feet. Yeah. And the other thing that adults do is that, uh, they assume I have now reached whatever age, 21 or whatever it is. I'm an adult and my feet will stay the same for the rest of my oh, life. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you get pregnant, your feet are going to go up a size. You know, I always think that actually pregnant women should see a podiatrist because just so they understand their shoe needs. Yeah. Um, you know, if you put on a lot of weight, if you have a car accident, if you lose sensation and you start changing the way you walk, you know, and you and I know of a gentleman that comes into clinic and everyone was like, his feet's enormous. And I went, actually, they're not that long. It's the width because what's happened with his disease process has meant that he's mm -hmm. spread his feet to make him more stable. So it's yeah. changed the shape of his feet. So I, going back to the previous question, I would say, don't assume, look at your feet every year. And a year is probably a good period of time to sort of go, you know, do you know, these shoes were comfortable when I bought them three years ago, but now they're killing my feet. That's probably because your feet have changed, not that so, the shoes have shrunk. No, but there are some good catalogs now, aren't there? Yes. Um, you know, for those feet where there are changes, where um, yeah. uh, you need to allow more swelling or more depth to protect the feet and so on. So if you look at Cozy Foot and you look at DB Wider Fit, which both we have both those catalogs in clinic and among their range, they have neoprene topped shoes. And we used to use this material a lot in surgical footwear because neoprene is the stuff they make dive suits out of. So um, it's got given stretch. And there's a company up in Glasgow called Buchanan's that are surgical footwear, but they have some off the shelf stuff and they use a stretchable leather. So, you know, there are things out there and that you can material wise that we're getting smarter about using that they and they're using in a more attractive way as well. Mm -hmm. So it is about getting on the Internet, because if you Google places like Reed Surgical Footwear and Buchanan's, they come up, but people go, oh, oh. Um, but they, these companies will have ranges of what we call off the shelf, but they're not off the shelf like going mm -hmm. to Clark's, they're, mm -hmm. you know, um, that you can reach out to. And especially if you're working in the medical profession, there's a company called Reed who do a shoe that's geared totally towards, and it has several features in it that are geared towards people with lymphedema. So really oh, small. Nice. Good to know. Now, 
Yeah, and we have used those for patients in the past and patients like them because when you look down at the shoe from the front, it's very tidy. So it doesn't look like a surgical shoe. Mm -hmm. And it has features like at the back, we developed a fold over heel counter. So it's still got a little heel counter, but it will fold over to accommodate that really extreme ankle swelling. Mm. And so there are things out there, always happy to talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, England's very lucky. It's got some very um, good companies that you know will work with you. So what you're saying is we don't need to resort to the backless shoes or the, the Crocs, which I, I know, I know. Uh, so, uh, but this, this is important because um, uh, some of the things that we hear people say is I'm a six, but I have to buy an eight to fit into, you know, but we don't. What we're we saying, that there are things out there that will suit a more swollen, swollen foot, foot. Shape, yeah. shape, especially when we think about this is not necessarily our specialty now, but diabetic feet where their, their toes are maybe more clawed, we've got to have more depth. Yeah. What, one of the questions I know is about rockers actually. When, when should rockers not be used is a question. I, I'm I, wondering if this person has read a recent article that's come out because somebody's come out and said, you shouldn't use rockers, they're a medical. Now, the, now I'm going to really confuse everybody because um, I don't know if you remember that sort of top shoe that I held up and said, oh, it's a really good shoe. And I was talking about the lacing on it. So I had it to the side. So there are rockers, which is a sole adaption and it is literally a bump underneath. So you rock forward. And then there's something called toe spring. And if you go back in that video and you look at that top pair of shoes and even the Doc Martens, it's the shape of the shoe, so it scoops up in the front. And that is in the, the actual shape of the shoe. It's in the last. So when they uh, mold the leather over the top of the shoe, it's incorporated in. That is an every decent shoe, to be honest. And that is about facilitating the flex point in a normal shoe. So while rockers are actually appearing in lots more shoes and definitely things like trainers to facilitate that sort of like rock forward medically we use it for things like arthritis okay that we're talking about people who actually have a medical problem with their joint it's painful for them to walk so we're tricking the body into thinking they are flexing when they're not because we're trying to take their pain away and for those people rockers you need to wear all the time in response to and I think this is the response that's come out of the College of Podiatry as well is actually I would argue there's nothing wrong with rockers However, if you've got perfectly normal feet, swap your shoes around. Don't be wearing rockers all the time. All oh, right, okay. Well, uh, we've only got a couple of minutes left, um, Ina. Um, I think that one of the things I've really learned about shoes is the importance of, importance of keeping the ankle moving. So, yes. so that's the link really for me in my clinical head between a shoe that is fitted to the foot yeah. Um, and yeah. the importance of pumping the calf muscle, uh, you know, to really improve the circulation with the ankle moving. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, that I often say to patients, because years of trial and error, I found this magic sentence that seems to work for everyone, which is where I say, walk along pretending you're kicking a ball. Because what that means is people will always put their toes up. And that really encourages you to hit the ground in the right position for your ankle to be able to do what it needs to be doing. And what often happens with elderly people, I mean, it's a recognized research change as we age, is people start doing this. Uh -huh. And what's not happening there is there's no ankle movement. Mm. And we know that if you've got venous problems, if you've got edema, if you've got a wound, if you've got a wound and your ankle isn't going up and down, Research tells us that that's going to stop that wound from healing and keeping, and if it does heal, it will stop you from staying healed. So ankle range of motion, because it's, if you, your ankle isn't moving up and down, it means your foot pump and your calf pump isn't working. Mm -hmm. And that's a huge issue for our patients or actually for anyone, to be honest. Brilliant. So um, hopefully this has been a fantastic session for those watching and, uh, and we've learned about what makes a safe shoe, what makes a, a less tiring shoe, which is an interesting one, um, and how we can keep ourselves fit and moving with good shoes that fit our feet. Thank you very much, Ina.
and uh, we look forward to having many more conversations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.